All right, this is a continuation of this lab series. Uh, my friend's probably going to be shocked that I did this, but I actually uh, hit this slab here and cracked it into three pieces. Okay, I originally thought I was going to crack in half, but uh, it's okay with three pieces. I'm going to nap each one of these on video and see what I can get from this slab. I'm not going to do this with the other slabs. I just wanted to do it with one of them. Right. At first I hit it right here, nothing happened, and then I hit it over here, and I thought I was going to crack it in half, but uh, got three, three pieces or three points out of it, right? So I think what I'll do is, what I usually do is I start with what I think is going to end up with the smallest one first, because those are usually the easiest ones to work, and then once I get used to the material, I can move on to the more difficult ones. So, I'm not sure exactly which one is going to be smaller, this one or that one. Uh, this one is more difficult, so I'll start with this one. Okay. And yeah, this will be a, a slab series of uh, th those three pieces. I'm not going to move on to other pieces until I finish these three. Okay. And it's a uh, hornstone, and I believe it's Indiana hornstone. Uh, hopefully I'm right on that. Okay. So let's see what we can do. And it's not heat treated for you guys that are just tuning in. Uh, this rock is actually uh, exposed to heat in the ground. So it's already heat treated by nature. Right? Hornstone is... Uh, I believe it's a sedimentary rock, but it's, submit, it's uh, subjected to heat and pressure underground, which changes its properties. Okay, so, and it's one of my favorites. It's probably my favorite type of stone. Okay, so without further ado, let's see. I'm a little nervous to work these because there's a lot of pressure to get these right and to make sure I don't waste this material. And I'm sure a lot of you guys are in the same boat. Uh, you don't want to waste the material. Uh, you don't know how to get several points out of this stuff when you get slabs. Um, I don't usually work wide pieces because it's extremely difficult to run long flakes on something thin like this. So I prefer to break it down and make several smaller points if possible. Uh, this was a gift, right? This, these slabs were a gift. I normally don't buy big slabs. I buy the little ones. It's cheaper and they're easier to work. Okay. But since I do have big slabs and since they're challenging and interesting, I will work the big slabs. I'll work all of these eventually. Okay. So let's see. I'm working... In case you don't know, I'm working in the back of my van, so forgive me if I have to maneuver around a lot. Okay, so I'm going to use steel. It's probably better to use aluminum, but my aluminum stuff is wearing out. And the steel does not wear out nearly as fast, so I'm going to use a steel. Okay, so the trick is just to biface these. And the way I work slabs is randomly, as you all know, or well, most of you know. So when I biface these, I pretty much just get rid of the square edge first. Being very careful not to apply too much force when doing this because even though the slab is fairly thick, it can snap in half. So I'm getting rid of the cortex first. See, I'm just barely on the edge of the cortex there. And it's cortex with a C, 
not Gore-Tex with a G. I've seen people mix that up. Uh, Gore-Tex is a some sort of waterproof fabric, I think. So it's a brand name. So it's Cortex on the outside. And some people call it a rind, you know, like a, the rind of an orange. That's what this uh, stuff is here. It's chalky material. This was cut on a saw. Uh, usually comes in roundish nodules. And you cut it with a saw to uh, conserve on the material. You can get more slabs out of it than you can spalls, usually. But slabs are more difficult to work than spalls. Because they break easily. Because of the uh, width to thickness ratio. They're already fairly thin to begin with. So slabs are really for advanced nappers, but a lot of the new guys are buying the slabs thinking that it's going to save them some time. It's a shortcut. Well, it might save you some time uh, when you're doing this, but, you know, if you're going to be breaking a lot of them, you're going to be wasting time. Uh, I don't think I don't think most of you guys are breaking them in this stage. I think most of you guys will break them as it gets thinner. Right as you're trying to make something out of it, shape it into the point you are thinking about, that's when you break it. Right exactly when you don't want to break it. Okay. Excuse me while I adjust this. There we go. I was off too much to the side there. Okay. So I'm just going around the edges. There's no big deal really. I'm just taking it off the square edge. You notice I did some burin flakes. These are called burin type flakes. Uh, just to see what it would look like, but I didn't I didn't get a, a central type ridge doing that. I tried to, but I didn't get one, so I've got to get that central ridge going. Why? Because that's where you create platforms and what I do is I just grind them down and look for opportunistic platforms. I don't really create platforms until I'm near the end of the process and I have to remove a flake in a certain spot. Either for damage control or for aesthetic flake removal or for shaping so it will look like the point that I'm trying to make. Now what is aesthetic flake removal? Those are flakes that make the point look pretty so to speak. Uh, whether it's like parallel flaking one flake after another or whether it's big bold flakes to make the whole surface look smooth or smoother than a bunch of little flakes or as a repair flakes that repair uh, mistakes in the surface like step fractures islands in the middle that are that steps all the way around them uh, sometimes there's lumps you know uneven surfaces you want to flake across those and make the whole thing flatter that kind of aesthetic thing it doesn't really add to the function of the point because it'll still cut or still penetrate a hide if you're using it as a projectile point. It's just purely for aesthetics. It has nothing to do with performance. Uh, so you need to create platforms for these flakes that are going to make the point look pretty in most cases because it these opportunistic platforms are not going to be where you want them, usually. Uh, the reason why I do that opportunistic thing is because it's 
faster for me and it conserves material. All right, a lot of nappers begin with big chunks and then with small chunks and that's just the way they nap. Uh, but I don't tend to nap that way. I tend to conserve what I'm napping. And I just like to do it that way uh, on video so you can see. Uh, I would love to be able to have a lot of material that I can just uh, go to town on. You know, start with a big piece and then go and then reduce it to a small piece and have the small piece flaked beautifully, you know, because I've prepared from the, the time I start with a big chunk down to the smaller piece. You can prepare in, in advance. You can see what you need to do to create the smooth surfaces on your finished piece. So you plan in advance, but you need room to plan in advance, right? Uh, what I mean by planning in advance is uh, if you start with a large piece and you start taking big flakes off and shaping the preform, uh, you can create a big preform with nice surfaces, right? And you'll have plenty of room left for the finished piece. Uh, if you have nice surfaces to begin with, it's like having a slab, but instead of flat, it's convex on both sides, which is better because then it's easier to run flakes across. So. After you get a good preform, it's easy to run flakes, and then as the ease of running the flakes makes the end product look better, and it makes you feel better, it makes the whole process much more pleasant. However, a lot of guys can't afford or don't have large pieces to do that with, so uh, including myself. So I will work pieces like this and try to save as much of it as I can. Now from here, what do we do? Now, I was requested to do an Ulu knife. So that's one option, right? I can do a triangular knife blade, thin it down and have a triangular knife blade, and then show you how to haft it onto a stick, and you know, and it would be an Ulu type knife. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to try to make a projectile point out of this. So I'm just trying to decide which is the point, which is the base. Um, you know, you want to preserve the length of it. So it, this side is going to come down. I'm going to take a lot of this off. So I, I just need to know, I just need to figure out which end is going to be the point, which is the base. Um, sometimes I'll flip it around and if I make a mistake on one side I'll say oops well that is now the base or this is now the point all right so let me see uh, you might ask why am I not going to do the ulu knife because that would be easiest that would conserve the most material yeah I know I want to do that separately because I think most of them were made out of ground slate or bone, right? I'm not sure exactly if they're made from stone. I had to, I need to do more research, in other words. Uh, what I was going to say is there's some cortex here, right? So I can incorporate some of that into the finished point, right? A little bit, little bit of color variation sometimes looks pretty cool. Um, but there's not much of a color difference, so maybe I shouldn't pay too much attention to that yeah okay I'm not going to pay attention to the cortex or the color variation there I'm just going to nap it down to a biface and then decide what to do from there As you can see, I chose this as the base because I'm removing the point on this end. 
Now I'm not going to remove too much of it. Not yet anyway. We'll see how it goes. Now, while I'm napping, usually what I do is I think about what point style is made from this type of material. What point styles are made from hornstone or similar materials. And I think I think a lot of guys are making pine trees out of this, which is a it's a sub class of the Kirk corner notched variety. These pine tree points with a lot of serrations on them. I think that would be cool. I think some McCorkle points are made from this stuff. Uh, there's various points that are made from this. Like, of course, Clovis. I think there's some Clovises made from it. Some artifacts. You can basically make anything you want as far as design wise even if it's not made from uh, hornstone uh, in the archaeological record you can make almost anything you want from hornstone any type of point it's so nice to work with but I'm gonna try to stay with maybe I'll make uh, Jack's reef types Pentagonal. Uh, Jack's Reef pentagonals are interesting because it looks like a lot of indirect percussion was used on them because they have bold flaking. Uh, it doesn't look like pressure flaking on the finished pieces. So I might do that. Three uh, Jack's Reef points. We'll see. Okay. So now I'm, I'm starting to drive flakes into the piece. Thin it down a little bit. I usually get a lot of people watching the bifacing process of the videos that I post. Like the first video I post usually gets the most views and then it drops down from there. The second gets less views and the third one gets even less. So it tells me that you guys are having the most trouble in this stage or you enjoy watching this stage more. One of the two or both or whatever um, I'm trying to think back when I first started I didn't have trouble with this stage all my misery came from the last stage finishing up this stage was always something I enjoyed doing even when I would break a lot of them still a lot more enjoyable in the final stages because in the final stages you have a lot an hour or something into the piece and then you break it yeah it's highly frustrating makes you want to quit um, and I don't get a lot of feedback on why people watch the first part in the series the bifacing I don't get a lot of feedback as to why so if you if you prefer the first stage, let me know. Or maybe it's just people clicking on it and then saying, oops, I didn't mean to click on that and then move on. Right? Or they don't even look what they're clicking on. They hear my voice and they go, no, no, this guy, yeah, I'm going to change the channel on this guy. Whatever the case is, let me know why the first video in the series is usually the most watched one. Maybe you have a theory on it. Or something. Maybe you can enlighten me, because I don't know. 
I don't really know why they do that. Okay. Why do I even need to know that? Because I could be missing something in these videos that would be valuable to a lot of people. What am I missing? I don't know why they're watching the first first part a lot more than the other parts. I'm just guessing. Okay. Yep, yeah, I'm just guessing because most of the questions come in after this is after the first part. I mean, most of my questions are not pertaining to the first part of the reduction process. They don't most of my questions have have to do with the, the final stages. How do you notch a point without breaking it? How thick does it have to be at the end of the process? How much are you conserving at the end of the process? Everything is end of process. What is this at the end? How do I sharpen it? How do I thin it down even more than it already is? Uh, what materials work best in the final stages? Should I even bother starting to biface quartzite? Or should I just move on to something else? I mean, is it going to be profitable for me? On finished points, um, how much thickness do I need at the end to keep it stable? You know, all that kind of stuff. That's not the first stage of the process. Okay, so for Jack's Reef Pentagonal, it looks like the point is going to be too, too narrow, but we'll see. I can, you can already see where this is going, right? This is going to be the center line of the biface. I'm going to have to lose a lot of this here. But uh, you can also see that I'm taking advantage of the fact that I've got a mass here to remove, so I'm sending... Hopefully I'm sending longer flakes across this way using this mass that I'm that I need to remove to shape these areas to send flakes in. Right? If I do set up a, a intentional platform, it's best on the areas that you know you're gonna lose. So I know I'm gonna lose this area here. Now could I make a blade it looks like this uh, lopsided yeah I could make a, a, a knife blade there's some artifacts that are asymmetrical but it's rare right but there are some that are asymmetrical they don't have they only have one barb or their the, the stem is off-center they have a small barb on one side and a big barb on the other that is in the archaeological record but it's not common you know, you, sometimes you don't know if it's a mistake or intentional uh, that sort of thing yeah I was hoping it would go further but it's not a problem so nice this stuff is so nice to work with that I'm even though it, the flakes don't travel as far as I thought they might I can get it later I can pretty much do what I want with this material no worries. Yeah, really nice. We have that one spot on this side that's the original surface, and that's easy to remove. It's close to the edge. You know, it's on it's on this side of the halfway mark, so it's easy. Now see, this stuff in the exact middle, that gets a lot of guys in trouble. So, that's what I'll be tackling next, right? I don't have to tackle it at this point, though. Um, I can take down this edge, thin it, and then worry about getting that later. Because it's, it's pretty smooth on this side, so I don't need to worry about sending flakes or having trouble sending flakes across 
So I think I'll thin it since the platform is already low here. I'll just send in some thinning flakes. A lot of this is second nature or subconscious. You don't really think about it while you're napping. It just happens, especially if you're an opportunistic napper like I am. You don't really think about, oh, I need to do it because it's low. You just look around and you see a low platform and you strike it. It's, it's not really uh, a big deal. Or some kind of painstakingly difficult thought process. If you are having a real hard time with your thought process, uh, either you're new or you're using your conscious mind too much. Let it, let the subconscious take over a lot of these functions. That's what you're doing. I mean, you're trying to train your subconscious to take over a lot of these things so that you can impose your will on this piece. Let your subconscious impose your will. It's better at it in many cases. Now, if your subconscious is getting into bad habits, that's not good. You're going to need to retrain yourself. But other than that, just let it do its thing. You don't have to constantly be thinking. Like I can talk and remove these big flakes at the same time. If I was brand new at this, I couldn't do that. But since my subconscious has been programmed to do it, I can be talking to you and doing it. Okay. So we're starting to get it thinned down, or I'm starting to get it thinned down. Now I'm looking at, okay, I've got to be more careful about where I'm going to remove flakes. I'm more thoughtful about where, not really the actual flake removal, but where. And when I hit this piece of steel, that's where the subconscious takes over. But before that, I'm looking to see, okay, well, now I gotta pay attention. Where's the best places? It's starting to get thin, so I gotta be careful. I st uh, I need to do some cosmetic flaking to get rid of the step fractures here. So it's a little more of a thought process to begin with. Setting up the initial conditions, and just let your subconscious take over the strikes. The actual hitting. And yeah, it's going to be different. If you're using steel, it's a little bit different than if you're using aluminum or copper, but not too much different. Your brain uh, adjusts. It makes the adjustment. If you're using antler, it makes the adjustment. If you're using hammerstone, it'll make the adjustment. Subconsciously, just as long as you have a clear picture of what you want your brain will make the adjustment to the tool you're using now sometimes certain tools are just a real pain in the butt to use and you know what I mean the adjustments going to be longer or not very successful it'll make the adjustment and, and do it the best it can but the brain can't work miracles with stuff that's difficult All right stuff that's really difficult it's a miraculous device but the brain cannot really work miracles all the time so change up the tool or the technique so that you'll do better that's what the conscious mind is for okay all right so 
it's getting to the 30 minute mark. I'm seeing a little sparkles in here, little sparkly bits of pyrite or something. That's pretty cool. I don't know if I, I don't, I have very little of the original surface left. I don't even think about it now because the flaking will cover that as I get thinner. All right, next segment.